Thank you very much, everybody. Hear me okay here? Thank you, uh, Jamie, for the introduction, and thanks uh, to the old State House for this wonderful uh, venue uh, for the meeting. Thanks to all who organized it. It's a wonderfully organized uh, leading up to that uh, to today and, and today as well. Um, I think we can all, if you've been to any of these conferences, you can appreciate that. We've all been to been to other conferences that are uh, as well organized as the uh, current Republican Party. Uh, <laughs> this is certainly uh, not that way. And thanks to Mark, uh, Christ, and um, how's that? Is that better? Thanks to Mark, Christ, uh, in, in absentia. Um, I was, of course, uh, both uh, pleased and honored uh, when Mark contacted me and asked me to uh, to speak here at the luncheon, uh, give a luncheon talk. Uh, I was also a little trepidatious. I accepted, of course, right away, uh, but I was a little nervous. Uh, to give a luncheon talk on Arkansas and the Civil War uh, when I'm a historian of neither uh, the Civil War nor Arkansas. Uh, I do the West, the American West and American Indians, cowboys and Indians. Uh, so it was a little bit of a challenge uh, to, to think of this, but you know, then I began to think about it. Maybe um, this is a, a good opportunity to, uh, to suggest that we, that we pull back and look at this period of a kind of a wide angle lens and to consider the question of Arkansas in the Civil War uh, a bit more broadly. And I thought one way to do that is to play with words. I love to play with words. Uh, when you hear a conference like this, uh, you often hear, uh, you know, the Arkansas in the Civil War and say, what's it about? Well, it's about the place of Arkansas in the Civil War, meaning the role of Arkansas or how the Arkansas affected, uh, how the Civil War affected uh, Arkansas the long, the long durée, uh, as Jeannie was talking about, how the memory, the, the place, you know, the place that uh, the war plays in Arkansas and Arkansas plays in the war. Um, well, why not think about it quite literally? What is the place that is the location of Arkansas in the war? Where does it, where does it sit, literally? Think about that. And I think it's a good opportunity to, um, to pull back again, as I said, and to think of, uh, think of this not in terms of the Civil War, in terms of its battles, in terms of, it, of the campaigns, in terms of the, the, the events that we normally associate with the war, but rather what we call the Civil War era. Put it in the larger perspective chronologically uh, as well as geographically. Uh, and if you think of it that way, the place of Arkansas in the Civil War era, that is a period from roughly 1850, 1848, 1850, to the end of Reconstruction, 1877, then the, literally the place of Arkansas changes. Our understanding you know, of where it sits in this larger story. And the key to this is expansion. The key to this is a period that was the topic uh, of a previous conference that they had here at the Old State House um, on the Mexican War, the period from 1845 to 1848, when this country expanded from this to that. Within three years, this country acquired 1,200,000 square miles. That's about half, again, the size of the Louisiana Purchase. To put it differently, if, if we were to expand by 1.2 million square miles today, southward, let's say, can't go west anymore, southward, then the United States would then include all of Mexico, all of Central America, and roughly half of Colombia. So think of what that, that would be today, the kinds of questions that that would raise, the kind of problems, the kind of challenges, the kind of opportunities that that would raise. Well, that's what happened in three years, in three years, 1845 to 1848. And specifically, as we move from, from that to that, and then, I should say, immediately after the end, the final moment of that expansion, that is the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, gold was discovered in California 200 hours before Nicholas Trist signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. James Marshall found those first flecks of gold 200 hours uh, in California. The, uh, it, uh, certainly the greatest coincidence in American history. Uh, there was an aphorism in the 19th century that said, God looks after uh, dogs, drunks, and the United States of America. Uh, and that's a, you know, there's something to it, I think, 
Anyway, so these twin events, expansion through 1845 to 48, plus the discovery of gold, uh, had enormous significance in the long run of this country. And of course, immediately what this did, and here's the point I like to begin with, is create a national crisis. Now we're used to thinking of it that way, of course, especially in terms of the Civil War, because what expansion did was raise the question of the expansion of slavery, and that was, you know, that sort of lit the fuse with the explosion that came, uh, explosion that came in, 18, in 1861, April of 1861. So expansion creates this crisis of union in that sense. But what I'd like to stress to you today is that expansion created two crises, and the Civil War era was a period in which this country dealt with two great problems, two great crises, twin crises. One had to do with the relations of North and South. The other had to do with the relations of East and West. What's fascinating is that they were as different as they were, they both dealt with the same kinds of questions, the same fundamental questions. For instance, both of them dealt with the question of the limits of federal authority. We're used to thinking of that, of course, in the, over here in the East, uh, the question was, where does federal authority stop and start in relation to state rights, states' rights? That, after all, was the, you know, the immediate cause of the war. But the expansion also created the question of what was the role of the federal government going to be in dealing with the West? With these one, more than one million square miles, what sort of responsibilities would the federal government have to take on? What kind of challenges would it have to make? And what we know, of course, looking ahead, is that the Civil War, the Civil War era, established the supremacy of the federal government in the East, but the Civil War era also, the same thing, the, cre the uh, addition of the West, also expanded enormously the powers and the authority of the federal government as it dealt with these problems out West. Richard White famously said, I put it this way, he said, the American West is the kindergarten of the modern American state. That's where the modern American state really begins to exercise its muscle. Uh, the, the crisis, um, these twin crises both dealt with the question of citizenship. Citizenship, that is the question, who are the Americans? In the East, of course, the question was uh, slavery. Those four million bondsmen who would be liberated, uh, emancipated uh, with the end of the war. What would their place be in American society? But the same expansion also raised the question of what, what about these roughly 100,000 former Mexican citizens who are now supposedly American citizens. It raised the question of what about these guys living out here? California not only becomes the richest place on earth, it becomes the most ethnically diverse place on earth. What do you do with them? Especially those Chinese, are like space aliens. How do you, what, what part are they to, uh, to play in American society? And of course, most troubling, what about those tens of thousands of Indian peoples, tens of thousands of Native Americans who are in dozens of different cultures, mutual people who can't, can't, they can't even talk to each other in their languages. How are they supposed to fit into this American nation? Are they Americans? Who are the Americans? So federal authority, citizenship, both East and West. And finally, most basically, of course, just the question of union. Will the Union survive? That was the question in the East. The question in the East was, will these two older sections, North and South, remain united in one nation? But expansion also raises the question, what about this new section out here? Far and away the largest section of all national sections. Far and away the most diverse geographically. Far and away the richest in resources. Far and away uh, the most challenging in terms of its terrain. How do we keep it in the nation, in the Union? How do we fit it in the Union? How will this work? How will these things work? So the point here I'd like to stress is that expansion creates again this twinned crisis of Union. Similar questions, different particulars. And it's basically you know, the same questions being asked in, in, uh, coast to coast now. So the Civil War era, I think, has to be understood Continentally, you have to bring the West into this story 
and to sort of play with the West and South, the West and East, uh, to, to understand the full story. Well, as Tom the Black asked earlier, so what? <laughs> what does that have to do with the conference on Arkansas in the Civil War? What does it have to do with us as Arkansans? Well, as I suggested in the title, um, I think it has something to say to us. Because the place, literally, the location of Arkansas in this story changes when you pull back and look at this wider story, this wider narrative of the, um, of the Civil War era. I've got here a series of slides that I sort of pulled off the web uh, that normally you know, show you the most important events of the Civil War. So if we stick with this first narrative, that is the Civil War happened in the East, <laughs> the Civil War was military, the, the, the Civil War era was about the North and South, the Civil War era was about this military uh, struggle between these two sections. Where is Arkansas in that story? Uh, well, not much happens. Right? <laughs> uh, not, to, uh, not to denigrate uh, the suffering that happened in this, in this state, not to, not to look down on, uh, on what the human impact of this, but let's face it, let's face it, step back and you know, look at this cold-bloodedly. If you stick with this older narrative, Arkansas is on the edge, over here. If you ask the question, just the carnage of the war. Anybody ever seen this slide? <laughs> this shows you the number of deaths during the war. Of course, the great slaughter pen over here. It's mostly here and in the deeper south. Arkansas, we've got, you know, we've got Pea Ridge and Prairie Grove here. But, you know, these are fewer than 250. Please, you know, don't waste my time, sort of thing, you know, compared to this stuff over here. So, again, Arkansas is sort of stuck out there. Bring in more battles. At least they, they do recognize uh, Pea Ridge. But... Not much else. I love this slide. This, is, uh, this shows you important uh, engagements, battles in the Civil War, but it's color-coded in a very complicated way. It's color-coded uh, by year. And you can see, again, over the, over the four years, most of the action is here. Out west, some in Arkansas, especially when you, you know, take the entire continent out west, you know, it's, <laughs> you can see from the color coding here, the Civil War militarily is over in the west, it's finished in the west, you know, in about 45 minutes. <laughs> it just, <laughs> it's over, it's over. Uh, and this is only slightly less true, less true with Arkansas. Pacific Coast. How many of you knew that southeastern Idaho was on the Pacific coast. Little known fact, okay. So the point here is that if you stick with this first narrative with Arkansas and the Civil War, if you think of the Civil War as the Civil War, 1861 to 65, and you think of that in terms of its military conflicts, Arkansas is on the edge. But what if you think of the Civil War era truly continentally? What if you take it coast to coast and deal not just with the military aspects, I'm not gonna talk think about that really, but rather the questions that were raised, the questions that were raised here in those years. Where is Arkansas then? Well, it's right in the middle. It's in the middle of that question. And this area, generally, Arkansas, Missouri, eastern Kansas, eastern Indian Territory, parts of Texas, this area that was often called the border back then, or the middle border, that becomes one of the most interesting uh, and one of the most revealing places to study. So on the one hand, Arkansas, if you stick with that first definition, Arkansas is on the edge. If you broaden the definition and think of it beyond the military, Arkansas is in the middle. And it plays a central role, this area of the border plays a central role in this larger, this larger story, this other narrative. So that's what I'd like to talk about that's why I like to talk about uh, this lunchtime, now afternoon. And I'd like to um, do that by looking at two, there are many different ways you can approach this. I'd like to do it in two ways. Talk about um, 
two topics, two general topics. The first one I'll call connections. Connections, because what expansion did by taking us all the way to the Pacific coast and then immediately by making the Pacific coast the most valuable piece of real estate on earth, what this did was raise this absolutely essential question of how in the world do we connect this new country to the old country? How do we bind the old union into the now expanded union? Now that was gonna be important anyway, <laughs> but, but when California, is, you know, think of it this way, if James Polk, James Polk um, in 18, at the end of the Mexican War, let's say 1848, he gets the news back, you know, okay, we've got this thing, and they finally passed the treaty in the Senate, and so, okay, we're all the way on the Pacific coast, and there's gold out there. Yeah. If he had a map before him, and somebody said, uh, Mr. President, put your finger on that place in this new nation that could not possibly be farther from you. He would, he would put his finger on the gold fields. He would put them in the richest place on planet Earth. So suddenly, you know, we have this huge stroke of luck, but it raises this immediate crisis, this immediate problem. How in the world could we, because there's all sorts of rumors, you know, the Brits are going to come in and take it. <laughs> How do we control it? How do we make sure that we hold on to this place? And how do we make sure that we benefit from this? Connections. We've got to connect it. And of course, this also plays directly into this building tension between North and South. Because both of these sections, as they, as they are pulled apart by the stresses of expansion, both of these sections realize you know, the Pacific Coast is absolutely crucial to our success. The North is thinking that. The South is thinking. And Arkansas in this middle border becomes the critical part of the Union for dealing with this question of expansion because it's out of there, you know, that the connections are going to be made. It's the jumping off place. <laughs> it's a great way to uh, illustrate this. It's this uh, wonderful um, factoid I ran across recently. Remember this guy? Uh, Jefferson Davis, uh, this is the later Davis, but uh, 1851, Jefferson Davis was a senator from Mississippi, uh, and he used the last meeting of the 31st Congress, second session, March the 3rd, 1851, to address what he considered an absolutely essential thing for the Union, and of course, in the back of his head, the American South. What do you think he talked about? What did he devote this last day? If you're up in the if you're up in the gallery of the Senate, what would you have heard Davis uh, talk about? Any guesses? Camels. <laughs> camels. He said, "Camels are the future. Uh, camels are the future for 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 connecting uh, the East with the West, and specifically the South uh, to the to the West, because of course the camels were so as a, as a desert animal, so." The Southerners, Davis, of course, wanted this south, this southwesterly connection. It's got to be between the border of Texas uh, across the southwest through New Mexico, what's now Arizona. And camels, he said, are the thing. The camels, he said, um, are our best bet. He said they can consistently move at 20 miles per hour. He said that they can carry small cannons. And best of all, he said, they're superior to railroads because they need less water. I love this. Go to the Congressional Grove and read it. It's, it's, it's great because he'll, you'll, you'll hear, hear him orating on camels and the need for camels. And then in brackets, you will see laughter. You know, so his, his fellow senators are, think this is absolutely hilarious. But he was, of course, was serious about this. 1853, he became Secretary of War. And the Secretary of War, he saw to the uh, importation of 76 dromedaries, which were used by the, uh, uh, by the military, uh, based primarily in Texas. Uh, so he saw this as a great a great way of connecting the South, uh, south to the Pacific Coast. Um, Civil War, among other things, um, brought an end to this whole camel experiment. Uh, they just let them go, incidentally, out of Texas. And some of them, three of them, made it to Arkansas, where they were rounded up and taken to Iowa and auctioned. So, uh, 
Uh, and if your student's looking for a good MA thesis, you can work on the Arkansas uh, camel trade. Um, <laughs> Anyway, but of course, as much as he, as much as Davis was uh, was was talking camels over over railroads, it was railroads that was his his real hope, and the Southerners and, and the Easterners and the North's uh, real hope for connecting, for making their crucial connection to the West. And as, as Secretary of War, of course, it was Davis who who uh, sponsored those four federal surveys of, of routes across uh, to the Pacific. It was Davis who ended up um, recommending uh, these Southern routes. Because again, he was concerned as the tensions grew, we're now in the middle of the 1850s, concerned with making sure that the South was connected to the Pacific Coast. He saw this as the, uh, the great hope uh, for uh, Southern modernization, uh, hope for the Southern, for the Southern economy. And look where, the, look where they're going, right up through here. Arkansas and right through here, this becomes, of course, the crucial transition point. For the Southerners, the South, this was absolutely critical. So Arkansas was seen as critical for this connection, you know, for solving this question of connection, specifically a southern connection. Well, even before these surveys were authorized by Davis, uh, there were these, these sorts, of, uh, sorts of plans uh, were afoot. If you had gone back to the Senate in 1853, you could have heard um, a series of speeches by this man, William Gwynn. William Gwynn was a Mississippian who had gone out to California. Uh, he had risen up in the ranks of the uh, Democratic Party in California. And in 1853, he was a U.S. Senator uh, from California. And Gwynn proposed this audacious scheme uh, for a federal railroad. This is before the surveys, again, 1853, a federal railroad uh, that was to link, uh, particularly the Southern rail system, to California. It was to have branches up into Oregon. It was to be based in San Francisco over here. And then it was to go down through Southern California, across the Southwest, from Texas to Arkansas. This would be its eastern terminus. <laughs> it was to be a total of 5,115 miles, 2,000 of those miles connecting Arkansas to, uh, uh, to California. Uh, he had to deal with the question of, of states' rights. So he said, uh, to do this in Arkansas, uh, we'll have to give Arkansas public land. Every other section on, side, on either side of the railroad, in other words, the very plan, of course, they ultimately came up with for the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, that it'll be Arkansas's job uh, to, uh, uh, to, build this, to build this railroad through here. Where would it, um, <laughs> where would it, where would this terminus be? It's not Fort Smith. This is down there in southeastern Arkansas. It's the town of Fulton, Fulton, Arkansas. Patrick, of course, knew where Fulton, Arkansas was. I had no clue. Anybody, how many are familiar with the, the town of, of, of Fulton? Okay. Um, see, I'm not an Arkansas historian. I, I love this because Fulton, I looked it up, and uh, Fulton was named after Robert Fulton. <laughs> so this other pioneer, of course, in transportation, in this case, the steam, uh, steamboats, um, uh, his name then was given to Fulton, Arkansas, which was to be in Gwynn's idea. And over and over, you look through, the, look through these debates and these discussions on the Senate for these, these southern railroads, and they keep talking about Fulton, Arkansas. It was going to be the place. Yeah. It's still there today, 285 people. I went online trying to find some sort of an image for contemporary Fulton, Arkansas. I only found one. Apparently found a dead alligator uh, in the Red River uh, near Fulton, Arkansas. So it's, you know, it really, uh, it missed its chance, let's say. <laughs> so, but this was the vision. This was the vision of these southern uh, slaveholding uh, folks in both the south and out in California. This was the vision that to create this railroad across the southwest into Arkansas, and it would be then, it would be the, then the, uh, the transition, the transition point. Um, the next year, after this speech that Gwynn gave, an even more audacious scheme was hatched. Uh, this was in the Southern Commercial Convention. This was the meeting that they had every year that would have uh, until late in the 19th century, in which the Southern economic interests would, would join together in some important Southern city to discuss the economic future of the, uh, of the region. Uh, in 1854, the Southern Commercial Convention was held in, in Charleston, a city with some pro-Southern, pro-slave interest. Uh, 
And there, uh, the proposal was made for, again, a Southern Transcontinental Railroad. But what was especially audacious about this was, it would have no connection with the federal government. This would be a railroad that would be built strictly by the South, with no federal help. The Southern states would band together into a great, uh, sort of, their own kind of a union, kind of a proto-Confederacy. And they would come up with the money to build this railroad uh, from California out to, uh, to the, connecting the southern states. Uh, it was a, a remarkable plan. And eventually, the resolution was passed unanimously in this meeting. Who was the proponent <laughs> of this plan in Charleston? Albert Pike, here in his full Masonic glory. <laughs> Pike. Uh, Pike was a, uh, we had a wonderful uh, sort of thumbnail sketch of Pike about Tom the Black this morning, but Pike was a uh, many, many things, as Tom said, uh, to Arkansas. But among others, he was a great proponent of, of modernization of Arkansas. And to Pike, the railroad was the key, as was the case for Southerners. We've got to get more railroads. We've got to get more railroads in the South generally but especially railroads that would connect us out to the, to the far west, um, coming, of course, through Arkansas, part of Pike's plan. Because he, he had long been, or not for the last few years before this, had been a, a person pushing vigorously for railroads in Arkansas, connecting to, this, to, the, to, the, to the west or not. Uh, in 1851, Pike had made a tour of the east in the Ohio Valley in the Midwest, uh, and he was struck by the incredible energy and vitality of life and society and culture in those places. Uh, he said, this, man, these people are eating us alive. They are far more progressive. They're modernizing so much more rapidly than we are. Uh, and then he came back to Arkansas and he wrote this on arrival you know, back, in, back in the state. He said, the contrast was enough to make one heart sick, comparing Arkansas with what he had just seen. A dull and stupid apathy broods over the entire state of Arkansas, like a great leaden-colored cloud. <laughs> well, so how do we dispel this cloud of stupidity? Uh, railroads, railroads. And most of all, of course, we've got, to, we've got to reach out from Arkansas to the west. This will make Arkansas sort of the, the centerpiece of this, of this great connection. And that was what this... Um, that was what this railroad was to do. And it was to be strictly entirely, entirely southern, as I said. Uh, he said uh, when he was calling for this, <laughs> uh, he said that, the, uh, that this was, he called on, he said they should be, let me find the quote here, oh yes. Uh, the South, he said, he's saying to the South, should be as Hercules of old said to the wagoner, put your own shoulders to the wheel and help yourselves. You had some critics in this convention. Uh, they said that he was a visionary, you know, that this is not gonna happen. You're thinking, you know, sort of pipe dreams. Uh, and he said, they said the same thing, Pike, this is on record, Pike said, they said, you know, said the same thing that you're saying about me, uh, about uh, both Muhammad and Jesus Christ. Which gives you some idea of the ego uh, that, we're, that we're talking about here. So, um, So, the point here, the point here is uh, that um, if we look at this larger Civil War era, and if we focus on this critical question of this crisis, national crisis, continental crisis, of connections, connecting East and West, this part of the country, Arkansas, and the larger border, becomes one of the most important and interesting places, interesting places to study. And in the minds of those people today, this was absolutely critical. This was the center of things. Something similar could be said about this second point I'll make. Indians. Indians, specifically, what do we do with them? Now, this, of course, was also, as was true of connections, as was true of infrastructure. This was a problem that had been there from the very beginning of the history of the Republic. What are we to do with these people? What is their role to be? And the answer from the outset was something like this. They will be eventually assimilated into American society. We're not going to kill them. We're not going to allow them to be independent. Eventually, at some point, they will be brought into this larger 
American family. Eventually, they will be made citizens. The strategy, up until the Great Expansion, was, of course, removal. The way you do this, they decided, by the early, starting with Jefferson, executed, of course, most infamously by Jackson, the way we do this is to pick up those Indians who are not yet assimilated, and we move them as far west as we can, and there we will allow them, paradoxically, you remove them in order to bring them into society. You remove them out there to give them the time necessary, the, the common uh, estimate was a century, a hundred years, in order to be assimilated, uh, to be changed, and to be assimilated into, into American society. So Indian removal was the answer. And of course, Arkansas and this area through here, the border, was the perfect place because it was the edge. <laughs> it was as far as you could go at that time, up until 1845. That was as far as you can go. So take them out there as far as you can go and uh, where they can still subsist, that is eastern Oklahoma, and allow this gradual process, this gradual process to, uh, to unfold. So Arkansas was important because it was the edge, because it was as far as you could go. But then look what happens. Well, removal. And remember, removal was not just of the five tribes. Estimate today is roughly 100,000 Indians, Eastern Indians, were picked up and moved into Indian territory and out of the New York State, the Ohio Valley, the Great Lakes area, and of course most famously from out of the, out of the Southeast. And remember as well that Indian territory, that is what they call the Indian territory, was not just what became Oklahoma, but also this long stretch up through here. I look at all, all the eastern tribes who were, who were put there. So again, you know, that was the answer. Pick them up and move them out here. Here's a map showing, if you go back, focus in on this area. All of these were, all of those were these uh, Indian groups. But then look what happens. 1848, we're all the way out here. 1848, this area is no longer the edge. It's right in the middle. In other words, we picked up Indians from the east because they're in the way of expansion and settlement and put them way out west in Arkansas and, and, and Indian Territory to get them out of the way of settlement and expansion. And less than 10 years later, they're right back where they were, relatively speaking. They're again right in the center lane, <laughs> about to get run over as they had been before. So what expansion does, among other things, is simply cut the legs from out under the basic policy that has been in place from the very beginning of the Republic and forced this nation. Part of this crisis was, what do we do now? What do we do now? Removal's not going to work unless you put them on boats, <laughs> there's no farther west to go, what are we going to do? The answer, of course, were reservations. Reservations. It was a kind of uh, internal removal, which you didn't, instead of putting them out geographically in the far edge of the country, you created islands within the country and put them there and put sort of, in effect, walls and fences around them and allow that gradual process to take place inside the reservations. That became the answer. But the point here I'd like to stress is that, in effect, these were the first reservations. We think of the story of the reservation policy, and we think of the gradual undoing of it and the col absolute calamity and catastrophe that happens to American Indians as a far western story. We think in terms of the Dakotas, we think in terms of Montana. We think in terms of the Great Basin. But here's where it starts. This is where, in effect, the first reservations were. And, it's a point to emphasize here, if you look at that, that story, there you can, see, you can see the first example of exactly what will happen farther west. This is where, you know, if, you, if you study this, then you don't even need to ask the question of what's going to happen out west because it's already happened. 
It's already happened. It happens here, not necessarily in Arkansas, but in this border area. This, in other words, in this larger crisis, it's this border area that becomes the precursor, the preview of everything that's going to happen out west with Indians. Where do we put them? The area right through here again. Why? How does that happen? Well, expansion, as I said, immediately going back to the first point, raises this question of connections. Connections, right? How are we going to get out there? How do we connect the far west? How do we get out to the far west? How do we connect the far west to the east? Where are those connections? Again, they're right through here. So in answering this question of connections, this immediately impacts this whole story of what to do with the Indians. Overland trails. Overland trails. With the discovery of gold, and you know, the, the number of, of people going overland to Oregon, to California, uh, increases, of course, enormously. 50, 48,000 people in 1849. 55,000 people in 1852. It's the greatest folk migration in modern history up until that time. And where does it go? Where does it start? Right through here. So you can think of this area that we're talking about here, that, that area on the map. Think of this as sort of the neck uh, of an hourglass. On one side, you know, people coming from all over America, all over the Atlantic world, funneling down through this narrow neck before they fan out into the far west. And where is that narrow neck? It's right through here. And of course, then the same question of railroads. The connection to the far west is going to be right through here. But that, of course, is also exactly where the Indians are. <laughs> it's where we put the Indians to get them out of the way. And now we put them on these little reserves that are supposed to seal them off. They're going to isolate them from the stresses and from the pressures of, of expansion. So, this area where it's supposed to put Indians to protect them, to keep them, out of the, keep them out of harm's way, to protect them and to put them on those reserves where they will be safe from pressure is also the place where tens of thousands of people are funneling through and it's the very place that they want to connect the railroads to. I can imagine these Indian leaders say, thanks a lot. <laughs> right? you, know, you took us out, you, took us, you made us leave home in the east and you put, a, put us out here telling us it would be safe here. We went to worry about all these kinds of pressures we had before. And this is the busiest place in the North American continent. You put us right in the middle, it's not just right in the middle of the nation, but in the busiest place of this great passage to the far west, whether it's people in farm wagons or whether it's railroads. And the result, of course, was absolute calamity, disaster. Eastern Kansas uh, becomes uh, the area of the most vigorous land speculation in American history up until that time. Maybe ever, maybe ever. Suddenly that land is worth a lot of money, as much as, as California. So you get this frenzy of land speculation, frenzy of people coming into it, trying to grab control of this, trying to grab control of this country, either to settle there, but more important than that, more often than that, sort of grab it as investments. So this is, of course, during so-called bleeding Kansas. Somebody did an article several years back asking the question, in bleeding Kansas, how many people died in Kansas directly because of the conflict over slavery? How many deaths in Kansas were attributable to, had, had in their germ this fight over slavery? How many there were? 57. Bleeding Kansas, 57. It's too bad if you're one of the 57. <laughs> but you know, not most of us think hundreds. You know? But there were far more people killed in Kansas over property disputes than over slavery. That was the fight. That was the fight. Political organization. Very quickly, here is political Kansas. Uh, this is in 1859. 
Thank you, 259. This is just a few years after the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Very quickly, it's organized into counties, and it's filling up with people. So where are the Indians there? They're not there. If they're on reserves, those reserves have, have shrunk down to practically nothing. Most of them have been picked up and pressed down into Indian territory. That's when Indian territory becomes the exclusive sort of catch basin for Indian peoples. Not until this happens. So this becomes that. Railroads. Eastern Kansas also became the most vigorous area of, of speculation in railroads and eventually in the construction of railroads. Look at all this. And guess who loses out? Right through, of course, exactly where we have put Indians supposedly to solve this so-called Indian, Indian problem. So, I guess my conclusion would be, like Tom Black, so what? Uh, <laughs> my conclusion would be, um, what is the place, literally, of Arkansas in the Civil War if you step back and think not just of the military conflict and not just of the tension between North and South, but think of the Civil War era in which we have these dual crises, a Civil War era that is genuinely continental, that ties in and plays off the question of North versus South, as in the case of the railroads. Pike and Gwynn and Davis plays off that, but it's also part of this larger story of the crisis of union that has as much to do with keeping the West, making the West truly part of the Union as it does with keeping the South within the Union. And if you step back and look at this story, that narrative in those terms, in those terms, then where we are right now, Arkansas in this area that we call the border becomes one of the most revealing and important and interesting uh, places to be studying this absolutely critical time uh, in, the national, in the national narrative. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.